Good afternoon, Tom. It's a pleasure to be interviewing you again. Today we have a subject that's been requested by some of your readers for you to discuss, and that is suicide. And we're going to take a look at it from your My Big Toe, Bigger Picture. Uh, one of my favorite playwrights, Shakespeare, wrote, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. He had a keen insight into human nature and he drew be beautiful characters, but he also had a, a sort of glimpse into the nature of our reality too. And by this statement it seems that he realizes that we are playing a role here. And he knew this, this experience was a role and that we are more than the role we play. You have said also that our purpose here is to learn and to evolve and interact with others. In the case of suicide, oftentimes people are very alone. They feel very alone. They feel in a lot of pain and a lot of depression. It seems that they're a little bit detached from their role as part of a bigger system and more focused on the me and more isolated and much more in a smaller reality. Can you comment on this question and can you offer some advice to help those who have had these feelings of being alone and contemplating suicide? And can you offer some advice for those who have been left behind by a family member or friend that this has happened to? Sure. Uh, I've talked a little bit about this in some other uh, uh, talks that I've given, but we'll be a little more expansive here on the subject of suicide. As you said, suicide often occurs at the end of a, a long kind of series of decreases of the size of one's decision space, the size of one's reality. The reality gets smaller and smaller and of course this is also the case with depression as well. Depression tends to shrink one's reality, the size of one's decision space. So it gets smaller and smaller until all that is in a suicidal person's uh, reality is themselves and their pain. It's all the things that are wrong, all the failures, all the inabilities to you know, to um, succeed, you know, everything that didn't work. They see everything from a negative viewpoint. If you try to explain something to them and show them some, the bright side of something, they will find a way to turn it around to where it's not really bright at all. You know, it, we, we hear the, the phrase about look for the, you know, the uh, silver lining in the dark cloud. Well, they look for dark linings in silver clouds. That's the nature of being depressed, and and depression, of course, is the is typically the prelude to uh, to suicide. Happy happy people who are full of joy don't commit suicide. So it's depressed people who are full of fear and anxiety and anger and you know feelings of being inadequate feelings of failure, feelings of there's just no way I can get out of this hole that I'm in, and so on. There's no way to change. I'm locked in. There's no exit. They have a very small view of reality. It's just them and their, and their problem. So they, their whole universe is shrunk down to with them at the center of it, and nothing else in the universe but the, the horribleness of the life they have to live. You know, it's that sort of thing. So let's look, now that's, you know, all suicides aren't like that. You know, that's just the one we're talking about. It's kind of the, the general concept of suicide. It sort of follows that depression route. Now there are other suicides like, uh, oh, let's say uh, somebody who has been given, uh, you know, six months to live, they're terminal. There's no question about that being terminal. And they're in a lot of pain their hospital bills are running at you know ten thousand dollars a week you know to keep them going and keep them alive and whatever and in six months at ten thousand dollars a week you know they're going to be in a great amount of debt or they're going to use up all of their resources sell their home you know and they see all that 
and their quality of life is very low. So they try to look up Jack Kevorkian and, uh, and have a, a uh, uh, you might say, a controlled suicide. So this is not somebody who's angry and upset and really, you know, wants to leave and doesn't have any, doesn't see any future for themselves. This is somebody who's just making a rational decision about how they uh, are ready to go because their quality of life is so low and they're not accomplishing anything by hanging around other than drawing out an inevitable end, you know, to a, a long, unpleasant, you know, conclusion. So they just make a rational decision that says there's no point in that. Let's go now. No sense spending the resources that other people that I leave behind could use. And it's not going to improve my life. It's just going to prolong it unnecessarily. So anyway, that's a whole different subject. So suicide can cover a lot of different areas. And maybe a surprising thing to say about suicide is that we shouldn't start from the idea that suicide is necessarily a terrible thing that should be prevented. Now obviously the case I just mentioned if somebody is making a rational decision to end their life because the quality is so low and the expenses are so high that uh, you know we would say well yes you know that's that's not something necessarily that you should step in and end but of course our legal system disagrees with that they feel like they need to step in and, 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 and you know interfere with that and not let them give that choice to the individuals but in any case um, all suicides even of the even of the first type we talked about where a person is depressed and their their worldview is very small aren't necessarily wrong from a big picture viewpoint okay now no suicides are wrong in the sense that you're punished for committing suicide in the bigger picture when you if you commit suicide and you then wake up in a larger reality, you pass on, you know, what do we call it, you know, passing on, uh, um, transitioning. It's not that when you get there, they say, uh-oh, you know, bad boy, you know, you committed suicide, now that's 20 demerits, and you're, you're now in some sort of trouble, you know, you've, you've created a situation where you get punished for that decision to have a suicide. It's not like that at all. There's no, there's no punishment. The only you know, the punishment is just the fact that you quit early and you're going to have to go back and do it again. So that's the punishment, quote unquote, but that's not really a punishment. That's just the fact of the way the system works. Okay, you opted out. You had trouble. You got into a fear spiral that took you down and down. You got depressed. You couldn't find a way out, you know, and you end your life. Well, there's a very high probability that there were many ways out you just didn't see them. There were probably dozens of ways out, things that you could have done, ways that you could have been, but you couldn't grasp them. You couldn't see them because you were so preoccupied by your fear, you see. So a suicide is typically someone who is obsessed with the things they fear. That's what depression is. Depression, people who are depressed have a lot of fear Fear of being inadequate, fear of being useless, fear of just being a, a, you know, an albatross around the neck of you know, their friends and family. Everybody would do better without me. And you know, my life sucks. That's self-pity, right? Woe is me. I never get any breaks. You know, I might as well end it all. I'll show those people. You know, and you have, these are all fear and, and uh, fear-based motivations. So people who are very fearful which means um, have a lot of ego. Those two go together. When you're very fearful, you have a lot of ego. If you're fearful, you will have you know, ego. So that, those are connection. Ego is an expression of uh, awareness in the service of fear. That's what ego is. So if you have fear and you express that fear in terms of your yourself, you know, I whatever, I feel this way, I, you know, you know, my, the I, my, me, mine sort of, sort of concepts, and you're expressing your fear in terms of yourself, then that's what we call ego. 
So all suicides are not necessarily bad things. Some suicides, again, not talking about the old people who you know opt out because their hospital bills are too high and their quality of life is too low, but even the people who are, de- who are uh, depressed, all suicides are not necessarily bad things. It may be efficient to end a failed lifetime, you see, and start over. It might be, but that's probably a, you know, a, a what do you say, probably in the margins. That's probably a low probability. But theoretically, you know, that could be a, a reasonable, or it could be a good decision. You may do better if you start over. You know, sometimes if you're working a job of some sort, you get yourself all tangled up in it. The thing to do is to quit for a while and then start over something else, or maybe just leave it alone because it, it just frustrates you when you do that. So that's a possibility that you could leave it alone and then get in another lifetime where things work a lot better for you. But for the most part, the huge probability, the thing that's most likely is that by committing suicide, you're you're making the whole process of growing inefficient. You're making the whole process, um, well, basically you're failing the process of growing. Rather than growing and get rid of the fear, you end up being consumed by your fear. So you are failing that process of growth. Now, if you're failing something and you figure out how to not fail it, how to turn that around and succeed, you learn a whole lot. There's a lot of learning there. A lot of growth will take place because in the process of turning around, you get a lot of ahas, I see, and then you can see where you were and where you are now and how small your reality was and how it's bigger. And, you know, it suddenly changes your perspective for the rest of your life. So there's an opportunity. Now, if you just opt out, and you commit suicide, well, you've lost that opportunity. So there's two downsides. I said there's no punishment, but there are some downsides about suicide. One is you're wasting your time. You're failing your process. You're you're leaving while you still have a lot of potential and opportunity. You just don't see that potential and opportunity. You can't see it because your fear has it all covered up. You find the, the you know the the uh, dark lining right in every silver cloud. So you're only looking at dark linings, and you're missing the stuff that would be good, the stuff that you could succeed with. It's your own attitudes that are the problem. So when your attitudes are the problem, and you have two ways to go, you can just quit. Well, your attitudes are still the problem. Nothing learned. You just quit, and now you gotta go back and learn again. Except, hey, it took you 20 years or 30 years or 40 years to get to that place where you were making those kinds of decisions and you start over, well, now you got a long lead up time to get there again. And there's a fairly good probability you'll end up at about the same place because that's who you are, you see? So it's not like, oh, this was just a bad, you know, This was just a a very unfortunate uh, circumstance. And next time it'll be a whole lot easier. I just got bad luck this time. Probably not the case. It seems that way that you've just had bad luck and everything's going against you and so on. But mostly that's self-inflicted wounds. You see it as everybody else is, you know, causing you pain, but It's mostly self-inflicted wounds. It's how you interpret the data. It's your own attitude. It's your own fears, your beliefs. Most of our pain is self-inflicted pain. So if if you are producing self-inflicted pain because your quality of consciousness is low, then when you try it again, you'll probably be in a similar boat again. Not the same boat. It'll be a different situation but you'll have to struggle with the same issues. So to quit and then start over is a very inefficient process. You see, it's like you're, you're, you know, you're, you're at A and you want to get to B, so you walk two thirds of the way and then 
quit because your feet hurt. Go back home. Well, you'll never get to be that way if you quit. So the thing to do is to find something positive. Look for something positive in your life. What little shred of neutral or positive can you find? Where might things change? And the biggest change, of course, you have to make is in yourself. It's not the world needs to be changed. Oh, if I just changed the world, my life would be great. That's not it. It's you that needs to be changed. You just need to change yourself. So it's like get a grip and try to deal with the problem and go on. Find something positive to, to, uh, you know, to work on, to become. Try to, to deal with the fear, you know, it's that kind of thing. And of course, if you're suicidal, talk to someone, you know, find someone you can talk to. Basically, things get bottled up inside, and the more you bottle them up inside, the tinier your picture gets because you start to obsess on, you know, the same thoughts over and over and over again, and they get darker and darker the more you just, you know, obsess on those. If you can connect with another person, talk about anything, talk about the weather, you know, talk about whatever. And that will lighten you up just by itself. Just communicating with other people about how you feel and what's going on can make a huge difference. Just because it gets you out of this cycle of, you know, things are really bad. Gosh, they're really, really bad. You know, and then they're bad, they're bad. Oh, yeah, they're really bad. All you hear is yourself telling yourself how bad it is. And pretty soon you believe your own, you know, your own interpretation of the data is actual fact. When if you talk with some people, you will get some new information in that might help you kind of lighten up your, your attitude. I think that's a very important point. You've, you've pointed out communicating, reach out to others. I think here is the idea that this role you're playing, you are never alone. We are connected, as you have said. And mm -hmm. reaching out to others is what this whole experience is about. It is interacting with others and I think that is a step to getting out of that loop of right. depression. Well that is where everything in a depressed person's mind, everything is, is very self-focused. It's a very self-centered sort of thing to be depressed. Uh, if you can shift your focus to what could I do to others? Is there anything I can do to help rather than my life is so bad, you know, and it's all about you and your life and how bad it is. Say, well, let's set aside my horrible life and let's see, what can I do? What can I do to help someone? Could I volunteer? Maybe at some helpful job? Could I become, you know, part of the Big Sister, Big Brother program to help unfortunate children? Could I do this? What could I do to help someone? And if you say, well, all I can do is sit around and feel sorry for myself, you see, well, then your next step is to, I need to, I need to let that go. Okay, my life is horrible, but I can help other people. I can be useful. I can be whatever, and I can do these kinds of things and see a bigger picture. Just knowing there's a bigger picture, just knowing that you're playing a part, as Shakespeare said, in a, in a larger play, is very helpful because then you know it isn't just you suffering this horrible life, but you're here for a purpose. You're here to grow, you're here to increase the quality of your consciousness, evolve your consciousness, and this is a test. This is a challenge. This is a thing for you to get through. And it's, it's not, you know, the world hasn't shrunk to a, to a pinpoint. There's really, you're just something small in a much bigger world, and if you see a bigger point and a bigger purpose and where growth should be going, and that there is a way out, and that everything changes. Your horrible life will change if you just have the courage to live it, and to live it, you know, by being helpful. It will change. Things will get better. You know, financial situations will improve. Relationships with people will improve. Relationships with your significant other, you know, will change and improve. Those things will happen if you change your attitude and become more positive. So life isn't that bad. You only see it that bad because you're so wrapped up around you. You know, my fear, my problem, my awful life, my lack of options, my lack of choices. 
my lack of finances, my lack of education, you know, my lack of being nice or knowledgeable or worthwhile, you know, my low self-esteem, it's all, it's all about, about you. So these are the things. Now, if you're trying to help someone, you know, if you're, if you're suicidal, then the thing to do is realize that there is a bigger world out there, that everything changes mostly based on your intent. You just need to see that bigger picture. Try to let go of the, of the overwhelming fear. And by fear, I don't mean being frightened. I mean the fear of, you know, that there's no way out. The fear that you're stuck. The fear that uh, you know, can never get any better. Because it can, if you have that positive attitude. And then, of course, a person depressed says, no, no, it can't. It can't get any better. I'm really trapped here. There's no way out, you know. But that's almost never true. It just looks like it's true. It's very difficult because of the nature of this reality. It is subjective and we can never really know how someone is feeling and what their what their life is. What are the things that can be done that might help draw someone out of this okay. small reality? Well, there's a couple of things. One, start a conversation. Get them talking to you. If you're trying to help someone come out of a, a deep depression or feeling suicidal, talk to them about anything that interests them. And at that point, probably won't be much that interests them. But there will be, there'll be a few things. Just get them to talk. Just sharing data with somebody will help about any subject. And if you can, of course, try to turn that subject to something positive some potential. Okay, everything's really bad now, at least it looks that way, but look at the things that the future might hold, the things that could happen. And the depressed person will say, no, oh, no, that'll never happen, you see. But at least you have them talking and thinking. So one is to communicate. That's important. Secondly, try to find something positive, something that's good. And it may just be, you know, your favorite Aunt Susie, you know, and you know, or it's your mom, or it's your dad, or it's your brother, or your little sister, or somebody who would really miss you and be very sad that you were gone. You know, there's, there's people who care about you, even if you don't think they do. There are people who care about you. There's people who are part of your life. There's people you're going to affect, you see, in many ways, and, and uh, you... If you see something positive, if you can help them see something positive, then you will help kind of chase away that there isn't anything positive in the, you know, there's nothing positive, there's nothing worth living for. Well, there's always worth things worth living for. I and mean, what we're living here for is to grow and to, you know, evolve the quality of our consciousness. That's always there. That never goes away. You just have to find another approach to do it. You need to change your attitudes. Try to find something positive. Respect them. Don't come out like, well, you're being, you know, a jerk, uh, you know, suicide. Don't you know that'll hurt a lot of people? That all you're doing is making them feel worse. You see, you're just heaping more scorn on the, what they feel already. So respect them. Talk to them as, you know, uh, intelligent adults making a decision. And one of the decisions that they can make is whether or not to continue living. So it's just like it's a decision. Like, well, I think I might need to buy a new car. And you sit down and you talk to somebody about the pros and the cons and what it might do for them, but yet, you know, the costs. And not just the money costs, but the, the costs. The other things that you can't do because you've done that and so on. So it's, you have to have a conversation that's not condescending, that's not trying to talk them out of it. It's not trying to change them, but an honest conversation of respect and caring and honesty. And if you approach that way, they'll begin to open to you. If you approach with, you can't do that. You know, that's a horrible thing to do. And try to tell them all the horrible things that will happen, you know, when they do this. Well, what you're trying to do now is bully them. You're trying to scare them into doing what you want, and the problem that they have in the first place is fear. And you're trying to scare them, you see. You're feeding their fear 
trying to manipulate them to do what you want, and all you're doing is making it worse. You're not helping at all. And the next thing I would say is that that's a good approach, the one I just said. That's a very good approach for talking with depressed people who are suicidal. It's a very good approach for talking to anybody under any circumstances. Let them be who they are, making the decisions they make, and don't judge their decisions. Simply talk to them about it. Maybe you can point out alternatives or other ways of looking at the problem or possibilities they hadn't thought of, but don't presume that you know best and try to tell them what to do and what not to do, and particularly make them feel bad about making a decision that doesn't agree with what you would have them do. You see, that's good advice, no matter who you're talking about, whether they're depressed or happy. Just treat people like that, instead of treating them about, oh, this person needs to change. They need to not feel this way. They need to make the decision the way I want them to make the decision. And, you know, a suicide decision is always a bad decision, so I just need to convince them and manipulate them to believe that it's a bad decision and then everything will be fine. It's possible that you might succeed in that, but it's unlikely. Mostly that's not a good approach, and you're as likely to make the situation worse than you are of making it better. Here's one more person telling them that they're wrong and bad and can't make a good decision and whatever, and it just heaps more scorn on the, you know, it throws gasoline on that fire. You don't combat a fear problem by creating a bigger fear. That's not, that's not helpful. Now, if you're in that condition, or if you're, if you're in that mindset where you're treating them as this is a decision, and you're just talking about it, and, and treating them uh, without condescension and without trying to manipulate them, because they're catching an instant if you're trying to convince them of something, you're trying to lead them somewhere, they'll resent it, they'll tune you out, you become part of the problem. Anyway, you have to stay open to the fact that it's possible, like we started out saying, not so likely, but possible that suicide is not a bad decision. Okay, We need to think about the problem from their viewpoint not from your viewpoint. You see, it's not about you. It's about them. Just like if you were, they were talking about whether or not to buy a new car. For you then to start talking about, well, you know, here's, my, here's what I think about me buying a new car. And it's like, excuse me, you know, we're not talking about you buying a new car. That's not the issue here. I'm trying to decide whether or not I should buy a new car. So you're telling me about what you would do your way it's just not helpful to me. You see, so you have to avoid that and you have to realize that there are some instances where suicide is a good choice, can be a good choice or a better choice. I shouldn't necessarily say good choice. It's, it's often, well, maybe it is. Sometimes it's a good choice. And I can think of a few examples other than old people who are about to die anyway. You know, there are some places where, where there may be an advantage in leaving. Well, I know you've helped many people through your books and the big picture perspective that My Big Toe offers. You've had many people write to you and say, thank you, you've mm -hmm. changed my life, and thank you, you've saved my life. And this was true, I think, for several people that have, that have uh, written to you. Can you think of any examples where this has been a turned into a positive thing. Sure, one, one major <clears throat> example uh, pops out where it's, it's unusual. You know, again, we're talking now in the, in the margins of probability. It's not the typical situation. And when I say things like suicide may be the correct answer for a, you know, a, an individual, that's in the margins of probability. It's not likely that that's the case. It's likely they've just dug themselves in a, in a fear hole and can't find a way out. But there are ways out, they just can't see it. But sometimes you have special cases. You know, I say that in a virtual reality, almost anything can happen you know, that you can imagine. Everything is a possibility. So there's lots of things that happen in the margins that aren't typical, you know, that aren't like standard but, but very uh, atypical. And one of them 
was uh, a well-known uh, a well-known duo right now is uh, Eliza Medhouse and her son Eric. Some year or two ago, uh, Eliza was a was a physician, and her son Eric, I think at about seventeen, late teens anyway, uh, committed suicide, and Eliza was very distraught about losing her son, particularly losing him in, in, that, in a violent way like that. And uh, she, she felt um, very depressed you know, over that. So her, result, her, her, her thing to do about it was to go out and find out more about it. So she became very interested in death and dying and, and you know, afterlife and everything she could find out about the, the dying process and the bigger picture of what's going on here, just so she got some context in which she could place this horrible experience in her life. And she came across My Big Toe and it made a difference for her. It made a big difference because it showed her a perspective in which everything wasn't bleak. A perspective that uh, said, you know, actually there's no such thing as death. Death is just a transition. You know, it's, it's not, in the big picture, it's not that a big part of your total existence. You have many, many lives, many, many opportunities to learn and grow because learning and growing means changing yourself and changing yourself is a slow process of becoming someone other than who you are now, you know, becoming different. And the way we become different, of course, is by becoming love, get rid of the, get rid of the fear and so on. Well, so she, she uh, saw there was a bigger picture, began to say, well, if that's the case, then Eric isn't gone. He's just not here in this reality frame anymore. He's around someplace. Well, maybe I can connect with him and, and get some closure and find out what he, why he did that and what what it's like and is he okay? You know that sort of thing. You know, mom mom wants to know is he all right? And uh, she found a medium who was very good and able to contact Eric. And then Eric and his mother Eliza went on to include others in bigger and bigger circles and pretty soon became a blog. And then it became, I think it's fair to say a book. There's some very extensive writings um, from the blog. So then it became a book. And now there's hundreds of thousands of people who are aware of Eric and Eliza. And Eric has become sort of like a teenage version of Seth. Okay. Seth was very formal, like, you know, teaching to the, you know, teachings by the master, right? Teachings, uh, you know, by the learned professor. And Eric is more conversational, uses, you know, colorful language, uh, you know, is a little, a little more of a jokester sometimes and a good sense of humor and so on. So it's not the, the very formal education you get from a Seth. So he's doing kind of a teenage uh, rendition of uh, Seth Speaks. They ask him questions and he provides you know, explanation. Of course, his explanation is still from his perspective. His perspective is different now than it was. So if you look at it and say, well, let's look at the total big picture. What are the, where are the gains and losses? Well, Eric and Eliza together have now opened, spread open the concepts of reality for tens of thousands of people. They have helped many other mm -hmm. parents that have had suicidal children see bigger pictures and see that, you know, it's, it's not all negative. There's a positive side. You know, your child has moved on. It's not dead and gone forever. It's just change of body, if you like. You know, it's just still continuing on that there isn't any death. And, so you, she's helped those, and she's helped other people who are, who are contemplating suicide because she's given them this bigger picture of what life's about and how it works. And Eric has, has you know, talked about the process 
and what he did and why he did it and how he is now and you know it's been very helpful so if you look at it you find that Eric who had some um, well, how should we uh, put that he had some uh, uh, physiology problems he had some brain chemistry problems there were some things that made his life difficult and because he had some things that made his life difficult, you know, he found getting along in this, this reality, particularly when you're a teenager, peers are a very strong part of your reality and peers, children can be very cruel, can be very uh, uh, damaging you know, to one's self-esteem whatever, you know, they, they're very, they very quickly can gang up on kids who are different and taunt them and tease them and, you know, make their life very miserable. So I think Eric had some of this he'd, to go through, to deal with in his life. He, he had trouble integrating into teenage culture because he was different. He wasn't just like all the other kids. He had some sensitivities and things that uh, they didn't recognize. So his life was hard. And he could have continued that life and learned to dealt with, with his problems and issues and, and probably done fine. Or, as it is, he's now become someone who has helped, he and his mom together as a team, have helped again tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people see a bigger perspective. So if you look at it from the big picture, which, you know, which way would have been a better way for him to have developed? To continue on and, and learn to deal with these things? Well, that would have been good. And he could have learned things there. Or the way he took, not only he developed, he saw bigger pictures. He's looking back at the context of what happened and how he was and the rest of it. And he's very positive about it. Now everything is positive. His outlook is, you know, this is great. I'm fine. I'm learning. I now have such a bigger perspective than I, than I had before. Things are, you know, falling together for me. And I'm helping hundreds of thousands of people see bigger pictures. Well, if you look at it from that perspective of the larger consciousness system, it actually turned out much better, you know, for the whole, the way it worked. You see? So now there's a very unusual circumstance, and it turned out very positive. He's probably learned more this way, grown more this way. His mom has learned a whole lot, grown a whole lot, so have probably the rest of his family, so have like thousands and thousands and thousands of other people. And, and uh, so there's this one instance where you can say, well, at least it turned out in hindsight that that suicide was a very positive thing, a positive learning experience. But when Eliza first found out her son was dead, there was anything but a positive learning experience. It was a horrible experience, you see. And she was at the end of her own rope with this experience. But look what it turned into. You see, well, when you don't then turn inward and start to focus on all the bad things in your life and start to get that spiral of constant you know, negativity, you see, well, look what can happen. Things you never could imagine. Eliza Medhouse was a physician who thought all of the kinds of things she's doing now were a lot of malarkey that mush-headed, you know, New Agers got into and made no sense. And now she's leading, you know, in the vanguard of, of uh, you know, this little piece of it that she's doing. So change can be dramatic. And had she just been thinking, well, Eliza, it's not that bad. Okay, this is a horrible thing. You know, life is difficult. But... Gee, things could change dramatically. And if you're depressed, you say, oh, no, they won't. It's the same old thing. I've got to live with all this pain. And it just isn't, I don't know if I want to go on or not. You see, but look at that dramatic change that nobody could have guessed. So that's the point. And when you see a bigger picture, you realize that it's always like that. The potential, no matter what you think, you know, if you're depressed, the potential is immense. Things can happen that are just totally invisible to you as possibilities. 
and you don't let them happen if you don't go out there and mix up with the rest of the world and interact and learn and grow and try to get rid of your fear and think positive and you know deal in the present let go of the ego you'll never find them if you sit in a hole created by your own fear you know and feel sorry for yourself so that's kind of a you know a story where you could say well that suicide turned out to be pretty good as horrible as it was it turned out to be a very positive experience for everyone including Eric and his mom it's a very rare case but that's in the margins as far as statistics go right that doesn't happen all the time but you don't know what is possible unless you go out and do it I think the significant thing might be for Eliza the the This is the other question I had. The survivors often don't know how to deal with this. It is a very horrible thing. It's uh, it generates a lot of guilt and a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So the example of this wonderful story is that Eliza picked herself up from this horrible incident and found a positive way, found your bigger picture perspective and I think uh, that's probably most important yes we uh, uh, guilt is just another flavor of fear so if you feel guilty oh I shouldn't have left him alone oh I should have sensed that he was getting deeper and deeper into the hole and, and it was getting critical. I should have stayed, you know, I should have talked to him about that. I should have done this, I should have done that. And you can beat yourself with all kinds of, I should have, you know, if I had just been aware, if I had just noticed, you know, if I had been more paying attention, if, 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 all of that is just fear-based stuff and it has no value to you whatsoever. It is what it is. Accept it that it is what it is. And now, given that it is, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to deal with it? That's what's important. What it is, is just a fact. How you're going to deal with it is really important. You see, that's the thing. So Eliza, yes, instead of just kind of wallowing and and going down that negative spiral of, oh, woe is me, you know, my life is awful, she started to, well, let's find out. What is it about this death thing? You know, what my, my picture, I only see it from the medical perspective. You're dead, you're done. You're gone. You know? That's what the medical picture would say. But there's others who think differently. And I always thought that they were a little goofy, but I really don't know whether they were goofy or not. That was just a belief, a prejudice of mine. Let me go out and see what's out there in the world. Well, then she runs into this and that, and now she's got a uh, whole different component whole different uh, reality going on in her existence that she didn't have. And and it's very positive for her. It's a very positive thing. And and it's not, you know, people will say, oh, yeah, well, she's just imagining all that stuff, you know, and it's, you know, it's one of these, you know, in her grief, she turned into a mushy-headed, you know, new ager. Not so. The interaction with Eric was very evidential. Eric did things, said things that only Eric could say and know and whatever. So she knew that this was, you know, Eric. This was her son. So there were lots of evidential things. And he interacted with people. He was mischievous with his interaction sometimes. And he would cause things to happen. And lots of people had these interactions. So the people who were involved with it very soon stopped asking, is this real or just people, you know, kind of wigged out on, you know, with their imagination because they want it to be true. Well, he put those questions to rest because of the things he did and said. They were very evidential. And uh, the people who are outside of it and didn't follow it and don't, weren't part of it, they're still saying, oh yeah, you know, a bunch of fushy, you know, mushy-headed uh, new age people who for some reason or another, okay, a mother's grief, I understand, you know, they want to believe it, so they, they make it up and believe it, and yada, 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 you know, they put that down because of their own ignorance, 
and their own fear. They just don't know. And they haven't been a part of it, so it's easy for them to put down because they have a belief. They're caught in a belief trap. If you were part of it and you saw and, and read and experienced Eric, then you didn't have that attitude. You see? So anyway, Eliza and, and Eric are quite a valuable combination. And both of them have learned a lot and so have many others. So there, you know, we just talk about suicide. So I, I say that, yes, it's a very unusual case, but I say that just to illustrate that this idea, oh no, you know, suicide, every, you know, you need to prevent, you need to stop everyone, you know, who wants to kill themselves, that's a bad thing. You can't let them do that. You need to stop them from doing that. Well, some cases that may be true. You try to help them, but you shouldn't force people. They have free will. Treat them as adults. They have choices to make. And then they have to deal with the consequences of their choices. And so does everybody else have to deal with the consequences of their choices. We're in an interactive virtual reality when everything that, you know, person A does may affect person B, C, and D. And B, C, and D just have to deal with that. That's the way it is. So rather than manipulate, interact without manipulating. And don't be prejudiced to think that you know what's best and you know that this you know, shouldn't be this way. It's a terrible, awful thing. And who's guilty? You know, who contributed to it and who isn't? And judge it and judge yourself. What you could have done and should have done, all of that is self-destructive. Just let it be. People make decisions and other people have to deal with them. See, it's not about you. You don't live at the center of the world and everybody else has to do things that make you feel better. If you commit suicide because you're my, my mother or you're my sister or you're my son, you're going to make me feel terrible. So don't do that. It's about me. You can't do that because, you know, it'll hurt me and I won't like it, therefore don't. See, that's just you trying to bully or manipulate somebody else. All that may be true, but that's not, that's fear talking. You're afraid. Well, if that happens, then, you know, I'll have guilt. I'll have this. I'll have that. It's your fear. That's the problem. So if you get rid of your fear, then death is just not such a big deal. It's just not a really big deal. It's part of life. You know, it's just what happens. And uh, it's part of the process of growing up. We couldn't grow up and, you know, lower the quality of our consciousness if death wasn't a part of the process. Because we just have this one lifetime. It's too short. There's too much to do. We wouldn't get very far. And then what happens? Then what do we do? Sit around on a cloud and play harp for the next 20,000 years? You know, well, that's silly, right? Of course not. You know, well, what, what, what happens next? What do you do? Well, there is nothing next. You just die, you're gone, whatever. You came here, you had an experience. It was all irrelevant. It didn't mean anything anyway. And then you're gone and all the people that ever knew you were gone and who cares anyhow, you see, and you can take that kind of a, a, a nihilist, uh, um, you know, nothing's important, nothing matters anyway kind of view. But that's also a very fearful view. You know, that does, that's, a, that's, that's a view that says, you know, there is nothing, so there's no point to anything. And then it, once you get to that point, well, you are depressed. That's the, you know, you're putting yourself in a depressed state. You know, those are the people that end up committing suicide, right? The people who have those kinds of attitudes that there's no point. It doesn't matter anyway. And of course, that's only, you only have that idea because you're ignorant of the larger reality and the way reality actually works, how things happen here, what the point is of your life. There is a point. Things do matter. And you just don't understand it yet. One of your statements was that this is an efficient reality. It follows logically that reincarnation is part of an efficient system. 
So how does reincarnation play into someone who has committed suicide or continues to do that throughout lifetimes? Okay, well there are, um, just like there could be a positive side to a suicide, like the example I gave with, with Eric, there also is most, as often and typically, there are two negative sides, two things about it. It's not punishment, just two things about it that then you have to deal with. One, we mentioned already, it's inefficient to short circuit a process. If your whole life's goal is to go from A to B and every time you get halfway to B, you turn around and go back, you're failing, you know, what your life is about. So it's a failed process. Secondly, it doesn't really put you in a better place because next time is likely to be not a whole lot different than this time because that's who you are. That's the way you are. So that's one thing. You have, it's very inefficient that you have, keep starting over because you don't have the courage to find a solution while you're here. Now, the second negative thing is, is that once you take suicide as a choice, okay, that's your choice, you make that choice, it makes it easier to take suicide as a choice again in another lifetime. Okay, anything, anything you do, it's easier, you know, it's harder the first time, it's easier the second time, and even easier than that the third time, and so on. So the other downside is that you can get into a, into a kind of downward spiral of when the going gets tough, you know, I exit, I run away. Instead of when the going gets tough, I face it and deal with it. It's when the going gets tough, I run away. And that then will be reflected in your whole life. It's not just in the suicide, but your whole life is like that. You know, things get tough, relationships get tough, run away. Schoolwork gets tough, quit. Job gets hard, you know, find another job. It becomes a way of existing. And if that's the way you make choices, you tend to then commit suicide more often in your incarnations. And your ability to learn and grow is diminished because of that attitude. To grow up, you really need to have the courage to make the tough choices, which is to change. Change yourself, get rid of your fear. You know, those are things that take a lot of gumption to do those. And if you don't have gumption because you've kind of worked yourself into this attitude of when the going gets tough, I quit, then that's another downside. But those are the two major downsides. Terribly inefficient, failing the process that you're here to, to execute. You know, you've got a mission here and that's to grow up, evolve. And when you terminate your your opportunity to grow up and evolve. It's like, um, you know, you've just made a bad decision. Most of the time it is a bad decision to commit suicide because you're giving up something that has a lot of potential for a, a start over to go back to the beginning. It's like you're on your game and you've, you've come a certain way around the game and you're only, you know, you're two thirds of the way to, to, you know, pass go and get $200 and you get the, you know, the you hit on the wrong spot and it says, go back to the beginning. It's like, oh no, I gotta, you know, gotta start over, gotta go back to the beginning. Well, that's the way it is with, with uh, suicides. You're constantly going back to the beginning and that gets easier and easier and more prevalent. And like um, anything else, if you continue to fail, then you become an ineffective player. If you continue to fail, you become an, ineff an ineffective player. Now, what do you mean by player? You're an individuated unit of consciousness. And I'm using the metaphor that you're a player in a virtual reality game. Well, you become an ineffective player. You're not growing. You're not evolving. That's your purpose. And you're, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. You're not helping you know, the whole system evolve. You're not helping yourself evolve and you're probably actually de-evolving, which is what happens if you get into the circle of, you know, when the things get tough, you know, I quit, you, you, you're de-evolving. You no longer, you have so much fear now that you can't, that you find it harder and harder to deal with it. 
So that kind of a thing, what would you do if you had a, if you were playing a Sims game and you had a character that just wasn't working out? Or you were playing World of Warcraft and you had some World of Warcraft character that just wasn't working out. You had this elf and the elf wouldn't fight. The elf didn't have any spells. The elf couldn't do anything. Every time you tried to get that character to do something, uh, couldn't do it. You know, it wasn't any goods. You, you'd never got any more hit points. You never got any up levels. You know, it just seemed to be that this character was just didn't have the right combination of stuff to make it in this game. And you're thinking, well, I made a really poor choice in putting this character together. Because, of course, you create those characters when you join the game. And they just didn't have the right collection of skills. All their skills were lopsided or they weren't right. What do you do with a character like that that, that continues to fail in the, in the purpose of the game? You retire them. You don't play them anymore. You go, you know, you find another character. Well, that's the, that's the downside. So you see... Even though there's no punishment for a suicide, it's kind of a step in the wrong direction. You're, you're, trying, you're going, you know, you're slip sliding downhill rather than climbing up. It's, it's that kind of a thing. So it's not that it's an awful thing that you can never recover from. It's not that it's always a bad thing that should be stopped. It's not that uh, you're going to get punished. It's just not a good, it's just generally not a good sign. Yes, you can slide downhill and then turn around and climb back up again, but better just to avoid sliding downhill in the first place. Then you don't have to climb back up again. You see, so we look at suicide and we say, oh, it's unfortunate. And it is unfortunate that people lose their, lose sight of the bigger picture and can find nothing in life other than, than this negative spiral that they've gotten themselves into. Now, Having said all that, I may say that a lot of depression has nothing, well, I shouldn't say has nothing, has, has little, has less to do with psychology than it does with physiology. A lot of times people are, are depressed because they have dysfunctional brain chemistry. That's all. It's not like, oh, your mother didn't love you, you know, your dog died when you were two and you never got over it and yada, yada, yada. We can do all these psychological things. But a lot of times, maybe even most of the time, it's just brain chemistry. You don't make enough neurotransmitters or whatever else it is. You've got too much of this or too little of that. And it's dysfunctional brain chemistry. So now, what do you do? Well, dysfunctional brain chemistry is just another challenge. You deal with it. Now, the dysfunctional brain chemistry comes from two ways. Fundamentally, it comes from two ways. One, it's just an accident of birth. In other words, it's just the way the probabilities worked when those chromosomes from the mom and chromosomes from the dad and all the history those chromosomes represent on both sides of the family all got together and mixed up and of the billions of possibilities, poof, out comes you. Well, if you're unlucky and those billions of possibilities out comes you, you come out with dysfunctional brain chemistry because that's just the luck of the draw, okay? So that's random, circumstantial. So now you've got bad brain chemistry. So you have to deal with it. Okay, so that's one way that you get it and that's just happens. Just like sometimes, you know, you're mentally retarded. Sometimes you're born with one leg, you know, sometimes there's other defects that you might have or other proclivities or other limitations. You know, maybe you just don't have an athletic build so you'll never be good at sports. You deal with it. The other way is from the opposite direction. And the other way, your, your, your uh, randomness didn't hurt you any. You come in with a full set that's all fine, you know, you're, you're, you're typical in that sense. You don't come in with bad brain chemistry, but you come in with a bad attitude. Now, when you incarnate here, you start with wherever you are in the process of evolution. So if you're not all that far in the process of evolution, you still have a lot of fear to deal with, which is what most of us have. I'm not talking about 
the poor, you know, poor slobs at the bottom of the evolution pile, you know, the 10% that are, you know, not doing well, I'm talking about most everybody. Most everybody has a long way to go. So, you know, we're talking about all of us for the most part. And so here you are and you have a lot of fear because that's what you come in with because that's your level. Now, if you start making choices that accentuate that fear, that push that fear, that grow that fear, then what you're going to do is start changing your physiology to support that fear. What's that mean? That means you're going to start changing your brain chemistry to express your fear. Because the mind follows, you know, the conscious, I mean, the consciousness leads, the body follows. If you're expressing fear, that expression will show up in your biology, in your physiology. It'll show up in your attitude. It'll show up in how much stomach acid you generate. It'll show up in a lot of your physiology will represent who you are. People who are constantly complaining and arguing and are unhappy in life don't live as long as people who are happy with their life. Why? Because they change their physiology to the point that it kills them early. You see? So you may start perfectly all right with your brain chemistry, and then you may change it to support the fear that you're expressing. Now, let's go on the other side. Let's say you are born with it. Now, if you express positiveness, if you get rid of fear, if you grow up, even though you have this handicap, all right, you got two legs, but you have bad bread, bad chemistry, but you deal with it and you deal with it positively and you, you find a bigger picture and you grow up. As you get more and more positive, your body will change that bad chemistry that you got randomly out of the, out of the mix of all those chromosomes and get rid of it. You see, you're not doomed to have that bad chemistry forever. That represents a condition that you reject having. But if you become fearful, oh, I got bad brain chemistry, life sucks, and you get into this fear thing, then you just reinforce what you got. If you grow out of it, that brain chemistry will fix itself, you see. Because your body, your mind, your consciousness no longer is supported by brain chemistry that triggers fear because you reject that. Now your brain, you know, now your consciousness creates a body that supports love, supports joy. So you, you just, you, you can beat that rap. You're not condemned by it, but you have to grow up and you have a difficult time because you start in a hole. You start a little further behind, but if you were born with one leg, you'd also be in a hole. If you were born with not an athletic build, you'd also be in a little hole. Just like if you're born very athletic, you know, beautiful, and, and uh, you know, perfectly proportioned, then, and, and strong and healthy, well, you start a, a little head, right? You've got a lot of extra margin there. You can make some bad mistakes and still recover because you just were lucky. Well, that's just the way it is. You, know, you, you accept that sometimes. Sometimes all those random chromosomes match up this way and sometimes that way. It doesn't matter so much as whatever it is you get, whatever cards you're dealt, it's how you play them, not the cards you're dealt. It's what do you do with them? What, what do you make of it? Well, you've only got one leg and one arm. What are you going to make of it? If you sit around and feel sorry for yourself and that's what you make of it, it will have been a very disastrous lifetime. If you say, well, I'll see what I can do with this. I'm limited, but, you know, I'm not out of the game. I'll do something else. And you might turn out to be Stephen Hawking, who can't even sit up in a chair. And he's a brilliant, you know, top-notch physicist, theoretical physicist. So it's not like if he sat around feeling sorry for himself because he got this awful disease. He wouldn't be a physicist. He probably would have died a long time ago. So you see, you can change, you can change those bad cards that you're dealt just by changing your behavior, changing what you, what you think, changing your attitudes, you know, changing yourself, becoming love, 
then your body will reconfigure itself to support love. Okay? And you'll be healthier, and you'll be happier. And Anyway, so that's, you know, that's kind of the way it is. So many people who are depressed are depressed because of their chemistry. And some of that chemistry, hard to say what. It's not, it's, it's not necessarily just random, you know, things that come out of, out of the, the uh, biological process of birthing, but it could also be what you eat, what you drink, the pollution in your water and in your air and in your food, and, you know, you eat junk, you know, your body has a harder time. You know, oh, your body's very adaptable, but it has its limits. You know, after 40 years of, you know, of making it work extra hard because you give it trash and expect it to deliver performance, you know, excellent performance, well, you start having these very common, uh, uh, what's called degenerative diseases. They don't really have any specific causes. They just causes just kind of grow and develop and get worse over the years. So the time you're in your 50s and 60s and 70s, now you have heart problems and you have diabetes and you have high blood pressure and you have strokes. And you know all of these are just what they call degen degenerative diseases. It's not like, oh, I got a virus and it gave me a stroke. You know, it's not like that. It's, you know, I lived a life of poor nutrition, low exercise, you know, as a couch potato. And now, you know, I've got high blood pressure and prone to strokes or heart attacks or something else. So we create, we create, you know, much of what we experience. So these slow degenerative things can also be slow generative things. You can turn them around. You can eat well, you can exercise, you can be healthy, and you can keep that positive attitude constantly working on getting rid of the fear and constantly working on becoming love. And suddenly your body not only can perform better, it starts to reconfigure itself. That person that just didn't have that athletic build suddenly can develop one over years. See, it works the same way. You can constructively build things that you didn't have. That biochemistry, brain chemistry can change itself around and now you have plenty of neurotransmitters you see but you don't it doesn't happen a week or a day just like you don't degenerate into disease in a week and a day it's a lifestyle it's a process of living it's a process of being so so that if you are positive if you are loved then things just work out your body works your mind works things work out things fall into place and uh, life is good otherwise you're struggling and life is hard. And then if you get into a negative thing, life sucks. You know, but all of these are your choices. They're all your choices. All right, you didn't get the bad brain chemistry at birth. That wasn't your choice. Well, that was just a thing to deal with. How are you going to deal with it? You're going to go through life being angry and, and upset and whatever, miserable, because you have you know, low neurotransmitters? Well. If that's what you decide to do, then that's what'll happen. Maybe you'll be one of those candidates for, you know, for uh, suicide. You know, you you get to the end of your rope and feel like life is useless. There's no point. My whole life has been just miserable. What's the point of going on? But if you want to, you don't have to have that result. You can outgrow just about anything. If you're born with one arm and one leg, you're not going to grow a new arm and a new leg. But you can grow to the point that not having that arm and leg really doesn't make any difference. You've still fulfilled your life. You've still grown and become. Let go of fear. Embrace love, you see. That's what's important. Not that you can run a mile, you know, in less than five minutes. That's really not what's important in life. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your insights on this very difficult question. And I like that you've left it on a positive note, that your intent can change everything about your reality. Yes. Thank you.